us about the Word of God. Hopefully, 
touched everybody in the congregation. So that week, um, I know we all have that drawer that has all those cards in it. <laughs> Don't bring them all. I just want the thinking of you and the thank you cards. And to share, make sure there's an envelope that comes along with it. And uh, if you have any stamps laying around that you never use anymore, bring those too and we can just use them. Okay. Mass Choir start, is starting up again Mondays up at the high school, $35 for our booklet, and a lot of fun, and uh, you learn how to sing. It's wonderful. I forgot to make an announcement last week. Um, the granny scam is, com is coming around again, so be wary. If somebody phones you and says that they are your grandson and they need money to get out of jail, you just Hang on. Hey, um, is coming the end of October, October 29th. I have some people who are giving me their list of favorites, so this is good. I'm going to start my list. So if you have any favorites that you'd like, I'm kind of thinking of Thanksgiving being the, the season of thanks, thanking and blessings. That might help you pick the song you want. And I heard from the Guild that they are decorating for Thanksgiving this Friday at 10.30. So be here or be square. <laughs> <laughs> and we welcome Reverend Brian Sharp. Thank you for coming and leading us in worship today. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Yeah, I've been gone about six weeks, so it's actually, church. we're good? We're yes. good. I've been gone about six weeks and I started to miss you guys. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, because I have no friends. Eh? I moved from Ontario and I didn't bring my friends with me, so I guess you have become my friends. And it's I, I enjoy the drive down here. I know winter's coming. But so far, I've enjoyed the drive down and listen to some, to some tunes and I do the same thing going back. It's a time of reflection and meditation for, for me. But while I'm here, I'm enjoying your company very much. I'm going to ask you to join me in the responsive call to worship this morning. It's Psalm 113, verses 2 and 3. Let the name of the Lord be praised. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Let's worship God as we sing hymn number 410, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore.
confession. Father, we gather for this Sabbath day as your people, and we do this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus. We humble ourselves before you and stand in awe of the wonder and the beauty of your creation. We thank you for this church family and for the way that you reveal yourself in the acts of kindness and caring that we extend to one another. We find in you hope and joy and the promise to be with us always. We are strengthened in your spirit and are directed by your teachings and the example of the saints who have gone before us. Father, you have shown us great love in the blessings around us, but we have also known your great mercy in forgiving us our sins. As we remember our wrongs this morning, we ask that you might hear our confession and wash away all our sin. Forgive us for living with too much pride and not enough humility, for choosing to walk away from the hurts that we cause rather than trying to bring peace and reconciliation. Forgive us for being apathetic instead of being engaged in the needs of others. Forgive us for being too judgmental and not showing enough tolerance and encouragement. Forgive us for our hurtful words, our dismissive attitudes, our joyless encounters with friends and family, and our moments when we choose to push you away and to live in darkness. Father, we confess that we could be a better people. We want to be a better people. Forgive us for the hurts that we've caused others and the opportunities to serve you that we've ignored or let them pass us by. In your great mercy, lift our sin and our guilt and renew us in your spirit that we might find new life and new opportunity to serve you and your creation. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Having confessed our sins, we look for some kind of assurance, some kind of promise by God to watch over us and to forgive us. The one I've chosen for this morning comes from the minor prophet, Joel, chapter 2, verse 13, where the prophet says, Come back to the Lord your God. He is kind and he is full of mercy. He is patient and he keeps his promise. He is always ready to forgive and not punish. Believe then the good news of the gospel. God is kind and full of mercy. And in his son Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let's sing hymn number 498. Sing them over again to me.
copy of uh, the Order of Worship, I noticed that there is just a thought uh, entitled in it, I guess, and I didn't find out until this morning when I was talking to Anna, that it gives the minister another opportunity to talk about something else. But if my wife was here, she would say, don't do that with Brian, <laughs> because you'll get two sermons, <laughs> and nobody wants that. But what we do want is beautiful music, and I'm going to ask that the choir now bring their special music uh, for our enjoyment.
the responsive reading, Psalms 130. From the depths of my despair, I call to you, Lord. Hear my cry, O Lord, and listen to my call for help. If you kept a record of your sins, who could escape being condemned? But you forgive us, so that we should stand in awe of you. I wait eagerly for the Lord's help, and in his word I trust. I wait for the Lord more eagerly than wash and wait for the dawn, than wash and wait for the dawn. Israel, trust in the Lord, because his love is constant, and he is always willing to save. He will save his people, Israel, from all their sins. Scriptures, Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not even... Not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had to be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, me he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of us unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Thank you. My understanding is that uh, last week you had the same passage. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, okay. You're all so kind. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully, and there was a baptism attached to that as well. So hopefully today you'll get something different out of mind uh, that you may be able to use this coming week. So I'd like to start this morning's message by asking you a question. Have you ever heard yourself saying the words, how many times do I have to tell you? <laughs> you have, okay. With children, it's how many times do I have to tell you not to wear your shoes in the house? How many times do I have to tell you to look both ways before you cross the street? How many times do I have to tell you to clean up your room? 
How many times do I have to tell you to finish what's on your plate before you can have dessert? And with adults, it's how many times do I have to tell you not to wear that old shirt when we're going out? <laughs> okay, so it is true, that one too. Right? I thought it was just a point, but <clears throat> how many times do I have to tell you to put gas in the car? How many times do I have to tell you not to bowl away at a job like that? You're not as young as you used to be. How many times do I have to tell you, go see a doctor? How many times do I have to tell you that you can't wash the darks with the whites? For heaven's sakes, how many times do I have to tell you to put the toilet seat back down? <laughs> How many times do I have to tell you? All of us have said those words to our children and to one another. And it's a strange statement to preface any concern or any frustration that you might be having because it implies on the one hand that there is a magic number of times that we'll remind someone of something and they will never have to do it again. Yet on the other hand, it implies that we will have to continue to remind that person because they just aren't going to change. The phrase is well worn by all of us. And in some ways, that is a good thing, a holy thing, some might argue. Because even when it is said with sarcasm, at the heart of it, the act of forgiveness is taking place. When I say to my children, and now to my grandchildren, how many times do I have to tell you not to wear your shoes in the house? What I'm really saying is that you've carried dirt into the house. I'm the one that's going to have to clean this up. And it causes me extra work, and I'm frustrated because I've talked to you about this before. But I am also saying, you're forgiven for not thinking. And I'm probably going to have to say it again in 10 minutes. Didn't I just tell you to take your shoes off at the door? Seriously, how many times do I have to tell you not to wear the shoes in the house? So often when a child or an adult does something to annoy or concern or frustrate us, we draw on those old familiar words, how many times do I have to tell you? And implicit in this is the realization that there is forgiveness of the incident or the behavior, but still forgiveness is spoken of in terms of numbers. How many times? We know in our hearts that we will have to remind the person over and over and over again. But still, there is a part of us that measures forgiveness numerically. Peter believed that forgiveness was to be measured in terms of a number. Peter's question to Jesus was, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? up to seven times? Now, perhaps someone had done something to hurt Peter. Maybe Peter's question was simply in response to Jesus' teachings that morning. For whatever reason, Peter wanted to know how many times he should forgive, and then he provided what he thought would be a very appropriate number. Peter thought that someone should be forgiven up to seven times. Seven is a biblical number and held in an eminent place among all sacred numbers. Because it was associated with completion, fulfillment, perfection. And Peter probably thought he had given an exceptional answer. Because based on the opening chapters of the book of Amos, the rabbis taught that for God's forgiveness was extended to three offenses and that God visited the sinner with punishment on the fourth. It was not then to be thought that a man could be more gracious than God, so forgiveness was limited to three times you could mess up. Peter 
here is more generous, however. He doubled the amount. He doubled the number of times an individual should forgive another, and then he added one more for good measure. Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? And Peter might have thought he finally had the right answer. To forgive someone who has wronged you or hurt you seven times is a lot. The average person that's being determined finds it extremely difficult to forgive even once. To forgive someone seven times was more than twice the amount required by Jewish law. And yet when Jesus responds to Peter, he says, I tell you not seven times, but seventy-seven times. The old standard of forgiveness was inadequate. Peter's standard of forgiveness was inadequate. Jesus offered a brand new teaching on forgiveness. And that shouldn't surprise us because Jesus is coming along and with all of the stories that we have through the New Testament, he's doing something different. He's challenging the way we live our lives. So in this story, in this parable, Jesus is offering a new teaching on forgiveness. Up to this point, forgiveness had been measured numerically, and that's about to change. In answering Peter's question, Jesus taught that there is no limit to forgiveness. We don't reach a certain number, three, seven, seventy-seven, and say, whoa, whoa, I can't forget anymore. I've reached my limit. For the follower of Jesus Christ, forgiveness is not a number. It's a way of life. It's an attitude. And to explain this a little more clearly, because I'm sure the disciples were sitting there going, oh my gosh, we're going to have to forgive this person and that person and somebody else, and we're going to have to keep on forgiving. So Jesus tries to explain what he's doing a little more clearly, and he shares that parable with Peter. He told him of a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants, so he called them in one by one. Now, one of these servants owed the king, in my translation, NIV, it's 10,000 talents. In the scripture reading that we had, it's 10,000 bags of gold. That's equivalent to $5 million Canadian. A vast sum of money. It would have been impossible for that servant to pay that debt. But Jesus exaggerated that figure deliberately. He wanted Peter to be able to see that the servant could never pay the debt no matter how hard he worked, no matter how much overtime he put in, no matter how many weekends he worked. He wanted Peter to know how impossible how smothered that debt really was. The debt could not be paid. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered the servant and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to try to repay the debt. And the servant fell on his knees and he pleaded with the king, be patient with me, he begged. And I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. The servant was free. The only thing he owed the king was a great big thank you. And what a relief it was for him. He wasn't going to be sent to prison. His family weren't going to be sold off as slaves. He was free. Thanks to the goodness of the king, the entire debt was forgiven. The king forgave the servant a colossal debt. And you would think that this act of forgiveness would change this servant's entire outlook on life. But that wasn't to be. The blessing that we find in the first part of the parable becomes a curse of incredible proportions in the latter part. 
You see, the forgiven servant happened to run into a fellow servant who owed him a hundred denarii. Or again, in terms of currency, our currency, that's approximately five dollars. Note the contrast. It would have taken an army to transport 10,000 bags of gold. But 100 denarii could be easily carried in a pocket. The average worker could earn about 100 denarii in just two months. In contrast to the substantial amount that the servant owed the king, the 100 denarii was nothing. And yet what happened? The servant whose debt was forgiven exploded in anger at the fellow servant who owed him that paltry sum, five dollars. He grabbed him and began choking him. Pay me back what you owe me, he demanded. And notice that the fellow servant said the exact same words that the servant told the king. Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But the servant remained unmoved by his words, and he had the man thrown into prison. The servant refused to forgive a fellow servant, a fellow debtor. And when the other servants heard what had happened, they were terribly upset at the injustice, and they went and they told their master all that had happened. The master, of course, was just living, and he called once again for that servant. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And the king was angry. And in his anger, he turned the unforgiving servant over to the jailers who would keep him in prison until he should try to pay back all he owed. And then Jesus ends that parable with the warning. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. The point of the parable is pretty obvious. We forgive others. Why? Because God forgave us. And of course, the point in using the exaggerated figures of 10,000 bags of gold to 100 silver coins is to drive home the awareness that nothing Nothing we can do to one another in any way compares with what we have already done to God. And if God has forgiven us the debt that we owe Him, we must forgive our fellow brothers and sisters the debts that they owe us. Nothing that we have to forgive can even remotely compare with what we have been forgiven. The message is clear. The message is stamped on our hearts. We forgive others because God has forgiven us. That is what empowers us to forgive. We have been forgiven. If we do not know forgiveness, in our own lives, then we have no forgiveness to pass on to another. But if we have experienced forgiveness from, from a wife or a husband, or from parents or children, from a brother or a sister, or from a friend or a stranger, or from God, then we know what it feels like inside to be liberated free from our prison. Knowing that, having experienced that, we must then realize and believe that we can release somebody else from their prison. We can take someone else's debt to us and we can forget it entirely. No matter how many times a person has hurt us, no matter how many times a person has let us down, 
No matter how many times a person has knowingly or unknowingly broken our heart, we are commanded by Jesus Christ to forgive them. Jesus said, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Forgiveness is not meant to be a number. It's an attitude. And it is a generous attitude. There is a story, some of you may have heard this before, a story that is told of a grandmother celebrating her golden wedding anniversary. And one of the guests asked the woman the secret of her long and happy marriage, and she responded, on my wedding day I decided to make a list of 10 of my husband's faults, which for the sake of our marriage I would overlook. And another guest asked the woman what some of the faults she had chosen to forgive were. The old woman replied, well, to tell you the truth, I never did get around to making that list. But whenever my husband did something that made me hopping mad, I would say to myself, lucky for him, that's one of the ten. <laughs> that's the kind of attitude that Jesus Christ would have loved and would love to find in you and I today. How many times should we forgive someone who has done wrong to us or hurt us? Seven seems like a really good answer on Peter's part. But not so, says Jesus. I tell you, not seven, but seventy-seven times. As difficult as it might seem, there is no limit to the amount of forgiveness we are to offer to another person. We are to keep on forgiving. That does not mean letting someone walk all over you. You may have to set boundaries to protect yourself, but forgiveness can still happen. On a personal note, my wife Allison and I have a 30-year-old son who for the last 15 years has been a chronic alcoholic. He is so bad now that he is drunk most of the time. He suffers from seizures in his withdrawals and he lives on the street. We've had to establish boundaries of our, for our own health and sanity. Boundaries like you can't call us when you're drunk. You can't ask us for money. We have also learned to forgive. When he stole from us, we forgave him. When he lies to us, we forgive him. When he manipulates, when he says horrible things, when he drinks, when he blames, when he embarrasses us, when he hints of taking his own life, when he calls us several times through the night, when we watch our child die one day at a time, right in front of us, when his disease is the first thing that we think of in the morning and the last thing we think of before bed, we forgive. Over the last 15 years, Allison and I, as his parents, have held him accountable, but have forgiven him every day for the things he has done or left undone under the influence of this insidious disease. 15 years, with all of its days, we have forgiven and forgiven and forgiven. Forgiveness is not meant to be a number. It's not seven times or 77 times. It's an attitude. Forgiveness 
is a way of life. Forgiveness is the acknowledgement that we have been forgiven. And therefore, in the power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we are able to forgive one another. Amen. Let's pray. Father, let your spirit soften our hearts this morning and help us to look with love and mercy at those who hurt us or wrong us in any way. Help us to forgive each other and strengthen our hearts without making them hard. May we let go of anger and resentment and revenge and begin to live in new ways having learned how to forgive and be forgiven. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship God, singing hymn number 350, To God Be the Glory.
and use these gifts and us to the furtherance and glory of your kingdom. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's come before God once again in our prayer of thanksgiving and intercession. Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge that all that surrounds us, all that is within us, is part of your creation and a blessing to be enjoyed. The beauty of this earth, the voices of our loved ones, the moments of tenderness, the challenge of the spirit, the tears and the laughter, all of life is rich and it is holy. Thank you for the blessings that come to us each day, Father. And as we remember them, we also remember those who struggle to find joy in their lives. We pray that your healing hand might be upon those that are suffering from broken minds and bodies. That your spirit might ignite a passion in us to stand up to injustice and to protect the dignity and the rights of the vulnerable. We pray that families would forgive and that friends would refresh us, that the angry would find peace and the anxious would find comfort. We ask that the darkness and depression that leads far too many people to take their own lives might be replaced with hope and trust that others care. We pray that those afraid will find courage. Those burdened by addiction might find release. Those lost will find their way. And that those forgotten might be remembered. Father, we pray for all those that we raise up collectively as a church family. And those that we remember in the silence of our own hearts. Father, we call upon you to heal the pain and the brokenness of those who suffer. Push back the darkness of this world. And for our part, use us as agents and witnesses of your love. For we ask this in Jesus' name, who taught us to say when praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 774, God Forgave My Sin, Free Me.
Go forth in the forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ, forgiving and loving one another through him. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.